بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد على آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقيت الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله tonight we're commemorating the martyrdom of the greatest lady to ever walk the earth the lady in which the Prophet of Islam brings forth in Mubahala and states that this lady is a representation of the ladies of Islam. What we bring forth as a religion is embodied within this lady of light, which is Fatima to Zahra. Now, as we know, there are different narrations that circulate this particular tragedy. And tonight is one of those narrations. And that's why we commemorate it. And inshallah, we'll look at why is it that we have three different dates by the end of tonight's lecture and seek to analyze the idea behind it and what we can learn from having three different dates for a tragedy such as Fatima to Zahra's tragedy. But one thing that strikes us when we want to learn about Fatima to Zahra's history apart from dying at such a young age is why is it that she was silent for many of the issues that she was oppressed with and other issues she spoke out and that's a very important lesson for us to learn especially in the 21st century and especially in the west when we find ourselves in a place where many people will attack us depending on different misconceptions whether it be for islam whether it be for Islamophobia, whether it be for not understanding particular aspects of religion, different faculties within the religion. So they'll attack you based on their ignorance. Sometimes we need to speak out to defend ourselves. Other times we need to keep silent to protect ourselves. Now within history we find that the Ahl al-Bayt themselves, there's many aspects of what they were attacked with, they kept silent. Other aspects that were attacked, they went out and fought against the oppressor of their time. So it's important to know in a 21st century basis, when is it or when the time is necessary for us to speak out? And what other times are there in order for us to keep quiet, maintain within, within ourselves the idea that Imam al-Sadiq state to us that the taqiyya is the religion of mine and the religion of my forefathers my religion and the religion of my forefathers that we can practice this particular aspect within religion. However, when we look at Fatima al-Zahra's life, we find that when she was oppressed, when she comes and her rib is broken, when she miscarries, when her shoulder is injured, when her face is slapped, we find many of these aspects Fatima al-Zahra kept and a notion where she kept it even from Ali ibn Abi Talib, her own husband. And the biggest idea that we have from this is when Ali ibn Abi Talib was watching Fatima to Zahra, all of a sudden he begins to cry and go towards the corner of the room. And when the maiden comes to him, why is it, oh Ali ibn Abi Talib, do I find you in such a state where you cry? The reply of Ali ibn Abi Talib shows us that there's a specific aspect in which even Ali ibn Abi Talib was not given the information about the oppression of Fatima al-Zahra. When he replies by saying, 
He says, only now do I know why Fatima al-Zahra in her last days didn't look me in the eye. Instilling the idea that her eyes were bruised. That's when his hand went on the broken rib, he began to cry. So Fatima al-Zahra in one notion, even though she was oppressed, there's many aspects that she didn't speak out. And then there's a notion where Fatima al-Zahra comes out. And we have the famous tradition, why Fatima al-Zahra left the house to protect Ali ibn Abi Talib. And when we have a tradition by, with Salman stating that Ali ibn Abi Talib tells Salman, tell Fatima al-Zahra to return. And when Salman says to Fatima al-Zahra, Ali ibn Talib says, return. Fatima's reply gives us an idea of the aspect that we need to look at. Some aspects were silent. Other aspects were vocal to defend Islam. Fatima says Zahra replies by saying, Oh Salman, they broke my rib and I was silent. Salman, they injured my shoulder, I was silent. Salman, they miscarried my child, I was silent. Salman, they slapped my face, I was silent. Salman, they've taken my imam, I must act. So there's a notion that we must learn from that particular aspect. Ali ibn Abi Talib in the Khilafah, he wanted people to come and defend him, people to have him or have his back. So, so we say when Ali ibn Talib says, I need 40 people and only a handful showed up to protect this message of Islam. One of the companions even showed up late to the particular place that Ali ibn Talib wanted them to come. So there's many reasons why, why we're silent. And there's other reasons when we come out and speak against injustice, such as our Imam that we commemorated not too long ago, Imam al Hussein, when he comes out and fights the tyrant of his time, when he comes and he is sacrificed in the tragedy of the 10th of Muharram, fighting against the tyranny of his time. Now, as people in the 21st century living in the West, we need to look at particular aspects of our Imams of Fatima al-Zahra to know the notion when to act and when to keep silent. Ali ibn Talib gives us an example. He says, I've never debated someone of intelligence except beating him. And on the reverse angle, I've never debated anyone that's stubborn except that he's beaten me. Giving us an idea that there's some people that you should waste your time. I shouldn't say wasting your time. You should use your time wisely with them, teaching them the right path, telling them of the misconceptions, clarifying to them particular concepts within the religion of Islam, and especially the religion of Ahlul Bayt. There's other people that they don't want to learn. They don't want to learn. They don't want to know the right path. They sufficed where they are. If anything, they just want to pick a fight with you. These type of people stay away from. And there's a notion that we need to learn from history. We know of our Imams, their stances against their oppressors. From Ali ibn Abi Talib all the way to Imam al Askari. And we know the stance that Imam al Mahdi, Ajallah Ta'ala Farajah al Sharif, will have against the tyrants of his time, more so than anyone else from the documented evidence that we have, how he will go out to fight the tyrants of his time and the oppressors. The Ashab give us an example that you can either stand up for what's right and be remembered eternally, or on the reverse angle, you can just go with wherever the wind blows, be like everyone else, and history won't even have a name for you nor will you be included within this particular circle that has the people that defended the message of Ahl al-Bayt. A person such as a teacher of Mutawakkil students. Mutawakkil had two, two children. Their teacher was by the name of Ibn Sikit. This particular person, Mutawakkil comes to him, he says, are my two sons greater, or do you love my two sons more 
or do you love Al Hassan and Hussein? Whom do you love more? You can think a person that has a position as a teacher of the children of a Khalif of the time is well off, is being paid, has a prominent position within the community, very respected. The safe thing to do is to say, well, you know what? Your sons are much more beloved to me than Hassan and Hussein. However, being of the people that follow in the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt, you need to have a firm stance in what you believe in, a firm foot, a foundation that you need to lay down to teach people that will come after you of the stances to have in the path of Ahlul Bayt. He doesn't say anything normal. He goes beyond. What does he say? He says, he says, he says, Shis'an al qambar afdal min wal min ka wa min waladayk. Andi wa and Allah. He says, a part of a sandal of Qambar, the servant of Ali ibn Abi Talib, is greater than you, O Khalifa, and your two sons, in my eyes and the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't falter. He says, no, 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 no. I want my position. I want this dunya. I want these wealthy Bonuses that I get from the Khalifa, the prominent positions that the position that I have within the community, how people view me. He leaves that all aside and says, No. He says, I want the akhirah. I will stand up for that which is right. That's what Ali ibn Abi Talib states. If anyone was to tell you, Curse me, this is the words of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Anyone says, Curse me to get yourself out of trouble. Curse me. But if anyone was to come to say, Dissociate yourself from me, never dissociate. Curse me, get yourself out of trouble. Never dissociate yourself from me. The words of Ali ibn Abi Talib. We have many other people within history had a firm stance. Companion of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Hajr, we find that when his grave was desecrated, we begin to learn of the story of what happened here when Muawiyah's men came to ask him, will you dissociate yourself from Ali? He says, never. And they said, we will execute you. He says, not a problem. I'll die on the way, on the path of Ahlul Bayt without a shadow of doubt. They said, what's your final will? He says, kill my son first. It's a very strange request because the happiest th time for a man, philosophically speaking, the happiest moment for a man that's undescribable is when their child is first being held in their father's arms. And arguably the most difficult time for a father is when he has to bury or when he has to see the death of his son or bury his son before him. So for a companion of Ali ibn Talib to, to request as his final request, kill my son before me, is a very strange request. Until we find out why, when they sacrificed his son, then he has a smile on his face. Why do you smile? He says, now I can die a happy man. Why? He says, I can be sure that my son died on the path of Ahlul Bayt. You might have killed me, and after that you would go to him, you would give him particular fearful statements. You might give him a bonus. He might be hindered from the path. He might be shaken from his foundation after me. So I die now knowing that my son has been sacrificed in the path of Ahlul Bayt. You can imagine. Other people in history, poets, when we find al Mu'tasim comes one day, he wakes up. This is a very interesting story to show you the power that the companions and the people that follow in the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt can have when they speak out against oppression, against tyranny, against rulers of their time that seek to oppress, that seek to destroy the name of Ahlul Bayt. Mu'tasim comes up one day, the eighth of the Khalifas, of the Abbasid Khalifas, wakes up one day, drunken as he usually is, I don't know what happened that day. He just said to himself, you know what? A person by the name of Bishr, grab him for me. So 
So they go towards the poet of Ahl al-Bayt. Apologies, his name was Du'abul ibn Ali al-Khuzai. They grab him, and then they take him to the courtroom of the Mu'tasim. So the Mu'tasim comes to him and says, how come you only say poetry for the Ahl al-Bayt? Why is it that all your poetry is in the love of Ahl al-Bayt? Why? Where the Abbasid Khalif is, we have a long line, we have much wealth, much land, prestigious is our name within these lands. We need you to say a poem about us. Why is it that you only say poetry about Ahl al-Bayt? The Abu looks at him and says, no way am I saying poetry about the Abbasid Khalifas. He says, you say these lines of poetry, and if you don't, I'll take that which is between or inside the sockets of your eyes. You either say poetry about us, or I'll take out your eyes. Imagine, a person's put in that position. How would we act? Abbas al Khalifa is in front of us. He says that to us. We're poets. We can either say a poet, get out of it, and then do khidmat to Ahl bayt afterwards. We can repent. Or we can have firm stances on what we believe in. The people come to him and say, be careful from the poets. Don't come close towards these poets. They're very dangerous. Their words can annihilate you. So he says, no, no. He has to say pieces of poetry about us. So it's a very long poem, Adabul says. The interesting thing is, if we can look it up tonight, it'd be very interesting to read. And it's very, you can have a bit of hindering of, let's say, sarcasm to it or something that may make you laugh from how he replies to Al-Mu'tasim, which was the eighth Khalifa of the Abbasid dynasty. It's very long. He starts off very standard. As he gets to the end, you know what he says? He says the Khalifas of Bani Al-Abbas, as we know, are only seven. And an eighth book from them has never really occurred to us. He says... خلفاء بني العباس في الكتب سبعة ولم يأتنا من ثامن لهم كتب كذلك أهل الكهف في الكهف سبعة كرام إذا عدوا وثامنهم كلب وإني لأعلي كلبهم عليك رفعة لأنك ذو ذنب وليس له ذنب Imagine a poet, a poet saying that to a خليفة of the time Nowadays imagine someone coming to any of the خليفات that we have so-called Khalifas in the Middle East and saying these particular lines of poetry, calling the Khalifa the dog, so to speak. How would the reaction of the Khalifa be? Who would dare say that in front of the Khalifa of our time? That's the power that these people and the certainty that these people had. And they knew they were going to be sacrificed one way or another in the path of Ahl al-Bayt. That's why they were a minority amongst many that only held firm towards the path of Ahl al-Bayt, that followed in the footsteps of Ahl al-Bayt. Only a minority. For someone to come and say such a statement in the courtroom of the Khalifa, to the Khalifa himself, as an insult, took great courage from a person such as this great poet of Ahl al-Bayt. But what do we learn from this? to apply to ourselves tonight. How can we find a stance nowadays when someone comes out with misconceptions? Because we live in a world where there's no, or in a society nowadays, there's no, let's say, knife to the back of your head. There's no gun towards your head, pointed. You may speak freely. You may converse freely. You can allow people to know what your religion is. You may be allowed to defend your religion to clarify particular aspects within this religion. Therefore, the importance is that when someone comes forth wanting to learn with an open mind, asking questions for the sake of asking questions or having misconceptions, but is open to be clarified too, that's when we begin the approach. That's when we begin to clarify to them the akhlaq of Ahl al-Bayt. 
That's when we begin to bring forth with our knowledge and our readings. And that's why we have to teach ourselves first before we teach others of what the Ahlul Bayt stood for. What did Ahlul Bayt wanted us to apply to ourselves and teach to others? The Imams tell us first and foremost, be messengers to this religion without the use of your tongue. So before you even speak a word to bring people towards the religion, act the religion. Your manners and morality towards your parents, towards your colleagues, towards your neighbors, towards your school friends, should be a khlaq in which people look at you and say, wow, this person must have a great religion that he follows, to have such manners, to act in such a way, to be that respectful, to not curse, to not have a foul mouth, to not deal with bad things, to not drink bad intoxicants, to not listen to that which is haram. People will begin to look at how this person is, what makes them, what and who do they follow. We want to follow them. Once they want that particular step, then you begin to teach them what the true message is. It becomes easy, but it first starts with your akhlaq. We can't remember Fatima al Zahra on the pulpits and say to ourselves, we love Fatima al Zahra. We would die for Fatima al Zahra, but we live our lives on a daily basis in the path of those people that went and burnt the house of Rasulullah, the house of Ali and Fatima. We say we love Ali ibn Abi Talib. All our Facebooks, our Instagrams, our tattoos, 313, and Ya Ali. We have the sword. But when it comes to application, how many of us use Ali ibn Abi Talib in our daily lives? And how many of us would make the people that opposed Ali ibn Abi Talib proud? Because there's a two paths that you can follow. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says there's no two hearts in the one body. Either you follow Ali or you follow his opposition. Fatima to Zahra, when we commemorate her and we remember her, is to remind ourselves that each and every individual here and in the world has a position to play within their lives. When we find that there's oppressors that came burnt the house of Fatima, and likewise, within history, that same people and the same followers burnt their tents on the 10th of Muharram. The same oppressors that broke the rib of Fatima. The same followers broke the ribs of Aba Abdullah. The same oppressors that broke or allowed Fatima al Zahra to have a miscarriage and kill the infant are the same followers later on killed a six month old, slaughtered him took his head and put it on a spear, same followers. And that's why when we have positions such as tonight, when we want to say to ourselves that each and every individual, if it's a male, can be a Hussein with every action. If it's a female, can be a Fatima in every action that you choose. And on the contrary, if you choose right, you're a Hussein, you're a Fatima, you're a Ali. But if you choose wrong in any path, whether it be small or whether it be large, never look at the size of the sin, Imam Zain al-Abidin states. Rather, look at who you're sinning against. If that particular act that you choose is the right path, you're following Ahl al-Bayt. But if you choose that which is wrong in the smallest stances, then you've chose to follow in the footsteps of that person that burned the house of Fatima al-Zahra. You're following in the footsteps of that person that sat on the chest of Abu Abdullah. So you have the choice in every single decision you make to be a Hussein or to be a Shimr. And we end on that notion for tonight, brothers and sisters. And inshallah, tomorrow we can look at more of Fatima al Zahra's life and especially the aspect that we need to look at, which is the oppressors taking away a particular right of Fatima al Zahra and the depths that we need to learn of why these particular stances happened 
after the death of the Prophet of Islam. But inshallah, from tonight we can learn that in following the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt, we need to know when to speak out, when to keep silent, in whom to speak out to, and with whom we need to keep silent. And all in all, we need to know first and foremost how to act within ourselves to learn how to act with others and draw people in to knowing what kind of religion do we follow through our morality and our akhlaq. We end on that note, brothers and sisters. So please help me in reciting and finalizing tonight's majlis and preparing ourselves for salat by blessing the majlis with a surat al mubarakat al fatiha but before it allowed salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Yes. <laughs>